Good morning, everybody. I'm Rushad Mistry from Wanchin Institute of Technology, Sholapur, and I will be continuing uh, from where we left off in the last session and discuss about rain sensing using time of life measurement. Now, the learning outcomes for this session are you should be able to describe rain sensing with T of measurement, that is time of life measurement, and then comment on applications and features of these techniques. Okay. So, reviewing what was non-contact rain sensing, remember we had had taken different types of non-contact rain sensing the last time and one one more technique that comes into the picture is actually triangulation and it's very popular using even the existing type of rain sensors and also with uh, rain sensors using a uh, video assisting that is camera based rain sensing but by far time of flight is the most uh, uh, preferred way of rain sensing and it typically includes intensity measurement phase modulation or frequency modulation Another technique is also interferometry and then you have other vision based techniques which include uh, measurement by using binocular vision and structured light approach and other techniques as well. Now, non-contact ranging if you recall, uh, we there were different types of range sensing such as LIDAR, radar and uh, even sonar in which LIDAR typically measures phase shift, radar measures the return signal intensity, phase shift and frequency modulation. They are all widely used. Uh, the reason why phase shift is preferred in radar you have to understand is the speed of light is actually is very significant. Okay, so Radar typically uses sound waves where the sp speed is significantly slower than that compared to light. Hence you need very sophisticated equipment actually to measure time of flight when it comes to light. So it is it is more prudent actually to use uh, techniques which measure phase shift and these are very accurate techniques. Um, LIDARs, let me tell you by the way, the very sophisticated LIDARs are very expensive. As for example, the ones which are used on autonomous vehicles, they are upwards of $30,000. So that's that will give you an idea of what is the quality of these particular equipment. And um, typically time of flight, like I said, involves intensity measurement, phase modulation and, and obviously frequency modulation. And then you have interferometry and vision based systems as well. So that's, uh, remember we have other techniques as well, we just tend to prefer time of flight uh, measurement. So how is this typically implemented? One is it's simple, it is based on physics of wave propagation and uh, most sensors involved in range of life measurement are active sensors. Not that passive sensors are not used, but we, uh, if, if you want to have greater control of it, then active sensors are definitely preferred. So, and uh, the, the process is very simple. A wave is emitted at the object from the sensor and then the range is calculated based on the time taken by the signal to return to the source uh, or by measuring the intensity of this return signal. So even though we say time of flight, typically it's, it's, uh, it's implicit that even the other techniques such as phase modulation and intensity measurement uh, are also included in that particular definition. So this basically shows you um, a picture of how things are. Towards the left, as you can see, you have an emitter, which is typically the sensor, which emits a certain energy source at the target, which may be light, like a microwave or ultrasonic. That signal then bounces off the target, which is then measured. Now the measurement, like you can say, but towards the left, the first image over here, it can be the point where you can detect the signal coming back. So you can consider this as the time of flight. Sometimes you want a better accuracy because this can be due to noise as well. You can actually measure the peak of the return signal and then you can estimate obviously the range. So all dif different techniques are used. More sophisticated equipment can use actually all of the above techniques. So ranging using time of life measurement, um, uh, typically like I said, involves in which a wave burst is emitted, which bounces back from the target and is then detected at the receiver, which is often uh, located at the emitter as well. The emitter and receiver may be physically the same package or the receiver may be mounted on the target as well. In certain cases, it is mounted on the target as well. So that depends upon entirely the configuration and the setup. Uh, the time of flight is the time elapsed from the beginning of the signal transmission to the beginning of the return signal. And hence we can calculate it as, now if D is the distance between the emitter and the target, then if C is the speed of light, then that into half the time of flight gives you an idea of what the distance is. Or, and if the receiver is attached to the target, then obviously the distance equals the speed of light into the time of flight. So that's a very simple arithmetic that's involved in this. So the, the critical aspects in this are actually the quality of the instruments and the sophistication of the instruments, the signal conditioning circuitry which is associated with it. So that is actually the more, you can say, the, um, the, more, the, the more technical aspects of the thing. The physics involved is relatively simple. 
Now, like based on the previous discussion that we had, what do you think affects the range and accuracy of these particular devices? Okay. So we'll try to have um, a discussion on the same. See if you can recall a few things from the previous class and we can continue with the discussion. Now, let's continue with our discussion. Um, and obviously, we are looking at ranging using time, time of line measurement. So we discuss what, how, how, how is this range defined? What does the range depend upon? So one, obviously, is the wavelength that is used. The other is, again, simple, logical, no common, uh, common sense involved here, that is signal intensity. Third, like I mentioned, is instrument quality, resolution of the instrument, the signal processing capability, all that. And propagation medium and then the last aspect is obviously you know electromagnetic noise so these significantly affect the range um, uh, um, at which an object can be detected and also in a in a very uh, in an appropriate way so th the issue here is when we see electromagnetic noise one thing would be um, one thing is obvious like for example in, uh, lightning and storms that very significantly affects range and quality uh, when it comes to radars and it's a, that's a known fact and it, even dust particles tends to obscure light so lidar is very much affected by the quality um, of uh, the air quality surrounding it uh, another thing also on which the range depends upon is the cross-section area and it's also the reflectivity of the target and the direction of the reflected ray now this typically was is um, uh, very important when it comes to radars and this is how your stealth aircraft actually have been uh, determined so uh, what stealth aircraft basically do is they actually have a very small cross section for a given size. So a comparable aircraft which is non non uh, stealth typically has a larger cross sectional area as seen on the radar compared to a stealth aircraft. And this is obviously achieved using one is uh, the direction uh, altering the direction of the reflected waves, which is what uh, some of the older stealth aircraft that the F117 did. And then what the other techniques we use typically involve absorption of the radio waves. So all these factors like the cross-sectional area, reflectivity of the target and direction of the waves affect the range um, uh, um, uh, at which the object can be detected. Okay. And so this is, uh, this uh, you can say is just an introduction to you to what, what stealth technology is uh, right now at the moment. And then w what are the issues now when it comes to time of flight measurement? Like I said, range also depends upon all those factors which we discussed in the previous slide. And uh, error typically depends upon what are uncertainties in determining the exact time of alignment. And these uncertainties are also based on what you choose to define as the return signal. Like if you want to define it at the beginning of the signal, then definitely there's a higher chance that certain uncertainties are there. If you take a look at the peak signal, then obviously it's you, your uh, accuracies are much better. But then you'll have to compensate for whatever the uh, differences that, that may arise because of it. Then limitations of electronic circuitry is another issue which introduces error in time of flight measurement. Uh, instrument quality, obviously the kind of circuits that you use, the propagation medium, the electromagnetic noise, and any other wave interference. So all this together typically affect time of flight measurement in when it comes to rain sensing. Uh, I definitely recommend that you read uh, Mechatronics Handbook by Bishop and um, that by Bolton it covers a significant aspect of time of flight measurement. Handbook definitely is a better choice. It has an extensive um, uh, discussion on range of uh, range of flight measurement using different techniques, including the ones that we haven't discussed. So uh, that is, um, I definitely ask you to look this particular thing out. Okay. So thank you. If you have any questions, please let me know about it.